Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, NPV Scheduler for Coal Mines. Our presenter today is Lee Poulin. Lee has been a mining consultant with CAE Mining for almost three years now. He is a graduate of the University of Alberta and first worked for Tech Coal as a drill and blast engineer and then made his way into mine planning. After a few years of freezing winters in the Rocky Mountains, Lee uprooted his family and moved to New Zealand. While there, he spent the bulk of his time scheduling and optimising open pit coal for solid energy. In 2011, Lee joined CAE Mining and made the move to Brisbane. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Eloise. Right, uh, I guess we'll start. Let me just share my screen here. So yes, welcome today to the webinar NPVS for Coal Mines. Uh, I'm doing this. Uh, this is targeted at coal mines, but anything that's where your deposit is stratigraphic, uh, it also applies. So NPVS, for those who are not aware, is actually NPV Scheduler. It's our standalone solution. Uh, competes with other programs that also do lurch grossman optimization. Uh, so using NPVS, you'll bring in your, your geological model, your economic parameters, and your engineering constraints. And you can use it just to generate an ultimate pit. But I think the what we highlight as the power of NPVS is how far you can take it towards giving you a realistic mining schedule. This next slide just shows the NPVS workflow, um, what we do. So first of all, we need to import our data. We set up our economic model. And we generate our ultimate pit from this. And this is, I'd say up to this point, this is what you would do in any package that's doing a Lurch Grossman uh, type optimization for open pits. So you'll get an ultimate pit. Uh, here we do have a note that uh, I'm showing you here in the middle where it says ultimate pit OES. So that means that our software generates a sequence for the blocks for every single parent cell. Uh, in, in terms of what it should be mined for maximum NP, NPV. Uh, using that, we then move on to generate our pushbacks. Once the pushbacks are generated, we enter them into the scheduler and are able to uh, work with that to try and get something that's optimum. Uh, we also have the extra tools of haulage optimization, mine flow allocation, and material allocation. And those will be covered, I think, in a webinar in two weeks. So that's the workflow. So these notes are specific to coal. Uh, first of all, you need to prepare your block model. Um, with coal, with other things, you would have, you know, grams per ton of metal or percentage of metal. With coal, we need to somehow figure out what we're going to value or what the product is going to be. Uh, in an, most often, I've targeted it as uh, clean coal. So I'll build in, down at the bottom, it shows a recovery factor. And I build that into the block model based on thickness. Uh, other things that I, ha I have done it before, basing it on calorific value and that the economic model paid on calorific value. We should also add in any other useful attributes that we might want to have in our schedule once we pass it on to uh, the accountants or the geologists who want to blend the material coming out of the schedule. So ash, sulfur, product ash. Uh, also, we can set up our rock types both by seam and by quality, whether you want to qual classify things as high grade, low grade, waste. Uh, other data that we can prepare is boundaries. Uh, 
So if you've got leases, property limits, we can also set up uh, boundaries that represent something that has a cost. So maybe you have a block model in an area, but you don't have the land access rights, but you do know how much it would cost to get access to that. We can build that into the, uh, or have the Lurch Grossman model consider those capital costs. Uh, other things, obstacles, rivers, historic sites, parks, utilities, anything that would it, that we can apply a cost to and we can have the system take care of that. And all those we are able to do those just as uh, boundaries in plan. Once we've got the model ready, uh, we can import either regular or sub-blocked models. The system does the uh, blocking up to parent cell size uh, on its own. Uh, everything remains as parcels at least by, by ore type or by waste type. We can have the system do reblocking, and when we bring it in, we just need to define what our rock types are, our, I guess specifically rock types, density, and products, uh, and any other attributes that we want to bring in. With the economic settings, once again, typical of Lurch Grossman, uh, we set up the economic settings. It will build in a value into each parent block. Uh, usually when I'm just given a product, I'll do a first, first pass uh, where I use basic settings. Um, I think as long as you get the term in terms of scale that the mining costs are properly related to the processing costs and that the uh, selling or the value is right in relation to those other ones. Uh, it, it should, so your Lurch Grossman will get your sequence right, uh, but to be, to get a more definite ultimate pit, it's better to have um, better economics. So we can either, if we have quotes or historical data, we can use those to build up some better costing. The next step is generating the ultimate pit. This is quite normal. We can do it by, it will generate LG phases by price factor or by profit factor or by cost factor. We put in our slope angles and our overall production rates and discounting, and that's just so it can calculate NPV per year, and any boundaries or control surfaces that we might have. The system does default to using the top of the uh, block model, so the highest blocks are the top of the block model, that's the topography, but we can feed it uh, mined out, other mined out surface, so a pre-mined surface, or we can also give it a pre-designed ultimate pit and have it do the Lurch Grossman uh, shells just inside that pit. Uh, the next step is generating our pushbacks uh, in coal. We don't necessarily call them pushbacks. We'll call them strips or pits. In our case, the pushbacks in our system are not the LG phases. The pushbacks use the Lurch Grossman optimal extraction sequence and then it's and we are able to specify a size of a pushback that we're looking for in terms of total ore or some other uh, it is customizable what you set up that, it, that it's searching for and then it will grab adjacent blocks and build a pushback that tends to be contiguous or all in all in one area touching not not little bits here and there. With the pushbacks, and the next step I do is I guide the pushbacks or control them by string. And I'll show you what that looks like in the demo. So our scheduler is forward and backward looking. It maximizes NPV over, over time and it considers not just every year at once sequentially, but it will 
consider multiple years and what gets the best result over time. It is target-based. I, I know the line before I said it maximizes the NPV, but we can also have it have different targets such as strip ratio, rock movement, truck hours if you're using the haulage, and those targets can be adjustable by time period. Uh, so, like if you're, if you're pre-stripping uh, or you have lower plant capacity in the first year or two as you're just bringing things online, uh, or over the life of your mine, there might be different requirements for fleet and plant. We can adjust those in the schedule. Uh, also, capital costs can be built into the schedule and they can be relaced, related to uh, time period or by pushback. So you can say year one there is an out, outright capital cost of something or other. And then once we move to pushback eight, we're going to need higher plant capacity, more capital cost. All right, so I'll move on into the demo. Uh, first of all, I can show you the data set, what we're looking at. So this is I've opened this up in Studio 3. We've got a kind of rolling hills or mountainous area, four major coal seams. Uh, they do outcrop. Uh, I haven't colored this right. Um, the major colors that you see are actually the uh, interburden or the waste. Uh, there's where the colors change, at that boundary, there is the, the seams. Uh, if I look at one of those blocks. No. I'm just trying to show some of the information. Uh, all right. So, Yes, if you have an ore body that is incredibly flat and your topography is incredibly flat and you're looking to do drag line mining, you probably don't need to use NPV scheduler. Uh, okay. So now that this is running, it shows what I've built into the model. All right, this is a waste block. I choose this block. This is a it's seam D, which is the fourth seam. I've got a recovery factor based on the thickness of that, based on that block thickness. I've already built in the recovery, so I know at 3.3 meters, we're going to recover about 91% of the tonnage will become product tons once it runs through the plant. Uh, So uh, here we come into NPV Scheduler. So I've got my economic model. Uh, I've set it up fairly simply uh, that the cost of, or the value of coal is $120 per ton. Uh, in this case, it assumes that we get that value at the mine gate. The mining cost is $5 per ton, and processing through a wash plant is $20 per ton. And the recovery, uh, it's actually using that recovery factor that we've built into the block model. So we're just saying a fraction of 1%, so it uses what's in the block model. All right, that's all very simple. We go to the ultimate pit. Uh, here, because we have quite a large, this is of quite large extent, I think it's mm, at 12 million tons a year, it's estimating 50 years of mine life. 
So I'm putting in 12 million tons a year as the rate, 10% discounting. Uh, let's see. And the overall slope, I'm using just a, no, a general slope of 41, 41 degrees. And we are using uh, a pit lease boundary. You can see there. So once I've run the, oh, the ultimate pit, so here's my optimized pits. It's generated close to, no, it's generated 100 pit shells. I can see. I'll just change the coloring here. So this area in the middle is where there's no blocks underneath the topo. And that's just because the block model has been limited to the bottom surface, or to, I think, 20 meters below the last coal seam. But by going and viewing benches below topo, it allows me to see, so the gray outline is the final pit limit. And the blue is where so that's where the Lurch-Grossman algorithm says you, that your first uh, shell would, would be. As we step through these, it's just making small changes. I'll, I'll make some bigger steps. So what we can see is that here along the east edge, the coal is the coal is coming up to surface, and it's a thick seam, so it is chasing that. Here in the middle, it's also chasing that thick seam as it comes up. Other than that, most of these areas where we have thin lines, it's just chasing the coal at outcrop. Right, once we get further to lower pits, we start getting down to a pit floor and pushing back the walls little by little. So that's what the Lurch-Grossman Lurch shell sequence is looking like. Uh, let's just slide that along. So from that, I can see that I have this middle bit that is high strip ratio. Uh, it's less likely to want to take that. Here is my, my LG phases report and my different phases. I started a strip ratio of 4.5 and my last shell is at 17.6 with an overall of 11.9. So uh, next we're just going to, so I've generated uh, pushbacks from these. I've allowed a huge number of pushbacks and I'm allowing, I'm allowing these pushbacks to be about 15 million so about a year's production per pushback is what I've set it to target. Uh, let's go to one of these other ones. So I'll show you, uh, first of all, I have the pushbacks where I've just allowed the system to run. I've just specified a certain number of ore tons that I want to come out of it. I haven't given it any other direction. And so what we see is the first pushback that it does, it is contiguous, the blocks are all touching, and it's daylighting that coal seam that's coming up to surface. And then it's chasing some things into the middle here, chasing some other seams that are coming up. I, I can see from these pushbacks that it's generated 
that the, this isn't the way that I'm going to want to mine uh, this accessing it is all over the place but it is telling me a general sequence of where I should probably start where I should finish so that's letting the pushbacks run wide open I've got these other settings where I've got it's called pushback PB80 and PB120 where I've specified a larger mining or a minimum mining width once again, show that. So once again, we're uh, taking the coal that's coming out of surface uh, with these wider, or a wider mining width, taking larger areas. So a slightly different sequence than the previous case, but probably more likely to be able to mine that way. It's still a bit all over the place. It jumps around and I think you're as far as dumping and where you put your stockpiles and haulage, it still would be a complex scenario or it would be hard to mine this way. I'll come so the next case I've actually made 120 meter wide minimum mining width. Change the color here. So I can see it's made this a bit wider. It's coming a bit further south. And then it opens up through the middle where the uh, coal is close to the surface or where there's a shallow area. There's also shallow areas over here that it chases. I think the general sequence is it goes along the east wall, cuts through the middle, mines to the north, mines the strip to the south, and then it will take out the high strip ratio ridge. So having run those pushback scenarios, I can see how it would like to mine it. And then the next step for me is I would guide the pushbacks because you really don't want you want you'd you'd rather design something with probably straight walls they're easier to follow so I've got a whole bunch of pushback boundaries that I've added here uh, but I've actually controlled all 14 uh, cuts or pits so if I go to my next scenario You can see that I've limited it to do the the north chunk of the material that's coming to the surface. Then it does the south chunk. Then it's going to progress into the middle and take the middle out to the wall. Next step is to release the rest of uh, the coal that's coming that's outcropping or coming to surface. Then we take some low ratio stuff in the north. And one thing about these pits, so you're not going to mine them quite, you will mine them in these sequences, but with a, with a mine this size, you'll probably have three or two or three, maybe four strips active at once. So, so this is how I've built it out. Uh, and these are sequences that I could imagine somebody mining it much better than those the Lurch Grossman shells. And just to show you how easy uh, creating those was, uh, I would go into if I'm in plan view, I can just come up here and say I want to make another pushback adjustment. I'd say, well, maybe I want my second to push back to come start and come through here. Do this area. 
if I apply that, I could say that it's it's the the new cut two, and that that's a forced limit. Uh, and if I put that into my pushback parameters as the limit for pushback two, then it will generate pushback two in that area. Uh, so that's a forced limit. We also have uh, different types of rules that we can use for those strings to control that pushback. Uh, all right. um, the next step is we've got pushbacks that we like. I'm going to set up my schedule to go to the other case. Bear with me a second. So first of all, we've got our time periods for the schedule. So we're scheduling by year, 365 days. We could schedule by quarter if we want. The only limitation of the software is that the maximum number of time periods is 200. So we have our four coal seams, and our consumption rate, total consumption rate is 12 million. Uh, t tons per year, and that's based on the recovered tons, I believe. Uh, here I'm also adjusting the consumption rate over time, so I'm only getting 1.2 million in the first year, 4.8 million in the second, uh, just 9.6 million in the third year, and every year that thereafter we're running at 12, 12 million. Uh, I've got tar targets here as far as uh, a strip ratio or a r total rock movement. I've decided I like the rock movement. It gives me the best result for consistent stripping or consistent rock movement over time. Uh, and I am in this case, I'm maximi or I'm having it follow the rock movement, or that's its primary objective and then it will maximize NPV on top of that. Uh, here we're able to control the parameters. That's just how, it, how it's going to break, break the schedule up, or break the pushbacks or strips up into activities. So it breaks them into activities by a, a, a bench, and then the bench will be broken into a certain number of, of activities or areas and it does that for each pushback. So I think in this schedule, there it ends up getting 600 activities from 15 pushbacks, and it will sequence those. Uh, all right. Let me just look at the time. So here, the rock movement is just the total rock. And my first two years, I'm going for 60,000, and then the next 18 years, 100, or sorry, 60 million, 120 million, and then after year 40, 106, or after year 20, I'm going at 160 million. After year 40, I'm going at 180 million total rock movement, uh, and I also have some minimums and maximums set for that. So now uh, we can look and see what the schedule looks like. So here's my schedule report. So uh, as far as the ROM coal, I can see it is producing that 12 million a year as I scroll down. My strip, my stripping ratio is bouncing up and down a bit. This is the inc the incremental by year. Um, I can chart that. Let's look. So I gave it that certain rock tons. You can see here, all right, my first few years are ramping up. And then it's, for the first 20 years, it's staying around 135, below 140. And then the next 20 years, it's 
around 1.6, 1.7. And then the last few years, yeah, there's some spikes and bumps. But overall, I'm fairly happy with the shape of that. Uh, if I were to use a schedule that didn't have follow that NPV precedence, So if I had it just target the NPV, and uh, I think here I'm not tracking, just let me check my settings. Uh, I was tracking the rock movement. So if I don't track rock movement, I'm just let this run. It doesn't take too long to run these schedules. It should take about a, a minute. But we'll find that it, the, uh, the net present value will go up. But as far as reasonable stripping, the stripping is going to be all over the place uh, with, with high years and low years. And that's not really something that you can usually deal with. So let's just rerun my schedule, 57 years. It's maximized the NPV, but let's see what it's done to the rock movement. The nice thing about this software is that it is easy to set up all these different scenarios. They don't take long to run. I apologize for taking a while to write the file. Right. Uh, so let's do a chart like that. So yes, this is if I run with only maximizing NPV. And you see that year by year, my stripping, or my rock movement is up and down uh, something the manager will probably not be very happy with because we'll be let having equipment sit idle every third or fourth year, it looks like. Right. So that's really how I'll, that's how I'd go about running different things. Uh, let me just switch back to the PowerPoint. So I can show what's happened because I've been talking about realistic schedules. So the ultimate pit that I ran, the value that it got from the Lurch Grossman shells was 5.97 billion. Um, once we've generated the pushbacks, I generated the three different types. The first case where I let it run wide open, it got 4.2 billion. Once I specified different pushback widths, it got 4.5 and then 4.4. And what's interesting is once I limited it and forced it to do um, pushbacks or strips that were engineering, engineering based kind of logical, it dropped it only down to 4.49. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that because I believe that those pushbacks would be achievable. We should be able to get access, do dumping. And then when I ran the schedules, uh, my initial schedule based on this pushback 80, uh, which was kind of all over the place, it got 3.5 billion. But once I've actually used my limited pushbacks, I'm staying in the same area uh, whether I, I've specified NPV precedence, strip ratio precedence, uh, or targeting rock movement. The difference between these two is the second rock movement, I've allowed it to have a bit finer granularity. It's increased my value by 40 million, which is not, in terms of scale, not necessarily that big of a change. But it's good to know that but even though I've forced it to do something that I think is more achievable, it's it's keeping, we're retaining a lot of value. Um, all right. 
So probably the last thing to show is I've got the animation from the schedule where it runs for the 50, 50 years and here I'm showing the, the benches below last and that just shows that I've got kind of three areas, three to four areas active at once. But yeah, that's what you can do with MPB Scheduler as far as coal mines. At this point, I think Eloise, if there's any any questions that we can look at. Okay, thanks for that, Lee. So we've had a few questions come through. Uh, the first of which does oh, okay. it do you want to read that out? <laughs> sure. Uh, so here it is. Uh, does it work with the gridded mo model or does it have to have a block model? The software does take a, a block model. Um, we can't feed it just a gridded model, so you just need to prepare that gr gridded. Um, so coal is stratified. How does the block size affect and take care of folded, splitted structure? Um, because we're able to take in subcelled models, I think we can we can take take that in fairly well. The block models that I brought in here, uh, I actually tried it with three different cells or parent cell sizes. The parent cell sizes were 100 meters by 100 by 10 meter, or 50 by 50 by 10, or 25 by 25 by 10. Uh, in those cases. The 100 by 100 was easy to work with. Everything ran really quickly. Uh, the 50 by 50, the runs were still quite quick. And the 25 by 25, uh, it ran for 24 hours and it still didn't find an optimal pit. So, uh, but in, in all those cases, the models were subcelled. So it's just those parent cell sizes that changed. But the cells actually where the coal seams are were maybe two meter by two meter by whatever variable thickness. So we are able to follow those folded split structures quite closely because we do accept the sub-block models. Thanks for that, Lee. Okay, our next question here is what about mining areas that are not adjacent? Okay. Um, I have worked on projects where and I think it's common that people do get leases that aren't, that the leases aren't side by side, they don't share a high wall. Uh, what I would do in that case would be to uh, probably generate two pit limits and generate two different ultimate pits. That's if the uh, block models are based on the same model. Uh, other, otherwise, if they're further apart and they have each that has their own separate block model, uh, at that point, we have the multi-mine module, and so we can generate an op ultimate pit for each of those models and schedule them together using the multi-mine. Thank you, Lee. Uh, our next question, once you've got the pit shell, how do you design from it? So the pit shells that come out of here, uh, I think this relates also to the previous question is, the pit shells are generated on the parent cell block or the parent cell size. So these are at, in my case, at 10 meter steps. Um, so what you need to do, or what I do, is I find out what the bottom seam is that each, in each area that the ultimate pit shell is going to. And uh, that's the best way to. Uh, um, I'll pull it up on screen here. So I've got uh, my topography. Or right, here's all right. Here's a final pit shell that's generated. So that was year fifty-seven. Let's go. Just change the color.
So I can see that it is following, uh, actually it looks like it's all following the lowest seam. So if I just load one of my, uh, let's see, like the C roof. Okay. So I can see that, uh, or sorry, D. Looking here at the bottom, I can see that it's taken the block slightly below that floor. So what I would do is I'd go around the edges of the pit, generate the walls along the edges, project those walls above and above the topo and below the floor of the bottom seam, and then combine the two. And that it makes it a lot easier because then you just work with the walls and the floor takes care of itself because you would actually mine down to the bottom of the seam. So, uh, anything else? Okay, uh, thanks for that, Lee. So we'll probably have to wrap up our question and answer session there. So this does mark the end of today's webinar. Thank you all very much for attending. We hope you found the content presented valuable. If you did submit a question that we were asked that we were unable to address, please rest assured that these have been recorded, so we'll touch base with you afterwards to follow up. You will now be redirected to an online feedback form. It will take no more than a few minutes to complete, so if you do have the chance, we'd really appreciate your feedback on how today's webinar went. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email to all of our attendees. This email will provide you with a recording of the webinar, as well as the necessary details to contact us should you have any additional queries. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you all once again for attending today's webinar and thanks again, Lee. Thank you.